and we'll come to order. Uh, today, the subcommittee is convening a hearing on the future of broadband affordability. So I want to thank uh, our ranking member, Mr. Thune, as well as Chair Cantwell and ranking member Cruz for working with me to schedule this hearing on such an important topic. I want to start with a story from one of my constituents. Um, her name's Kelly, and she's from a small community by the name of Ranchos de Taos out in New Mexico. Now, she reached out to my office last month about the importance of the Affordable Connectivity Program. And here's what she said, quote, in my capacity as program manager for New Mexico Veterans upbound, Upward Bound Program at UNM Taos, my team and I serve veterans in eight northern New Mexico counties in some very rural areas. We are finding it more difficult to connect our native veterans who may not even be aware of the benefits that they've earned or are unable to apply for them since most communications is via the internet. My team is working on that. Many live in extremely remote areas and only receive phone or internet service when they go into the nearest town. That's not fair. They are no less deserving of veteran benefits than anyone else." End quote. Now, I want to emphasize that point because it's why we're here today. The people who rely on the Affordable Connectivity Program to connect with healthcare providers, attend work or school, or access their benefits are no less deserving anywhere across America than anyone else. There are still many areas across the country where families have no options for high quality broadband service. That's why we worked together to pass the bipartisan infrastructure law, which included the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment, otherwise known as the BEAD program, to build out broadband networks in regions of our country that have until now been left behind. But building the network isn't the end of the story. We have to make sure that people can afford to access it. That is why we created the Affordable Connectivity Program in a bipartisan way, to help low-income families afford internet service by contributing a $30 per month benefit. Right now, there are over 23 million households participating in this program. That's more than 55 million people. But it's not only benefiting these individuals and families, it's benefiting their local communities as well. A study from the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society published last month found that every dollar that is put into ACP returns nearly $2 in impact for the recipient of the benefit. It gives families access to better paying jobs, to training and education, to create economic mobility, to better deals on groceries and household goods. It means stimulating our local economies. So the time is now to save this program. This last full month of funding for ACP, um, we saw the expiration um, just a few days ago. Now, each household will only receive a partial benefit if Congress fails to act. That will be the end of the Affordable Connectivity Program. And, and mind you, all of these customers across America received notices back in January as well that this program was going away. Congress had a little bit of time to be able to fix things, to get this correct. But here's another one where Congress let the American people down. My colleagues and I have been working to find a solution to keep this program going. Thank you to Chair Cantwell, who has introduced legislation to restore the FCC's auction authority and use $7 billion in auction proceeds to keep this program alive. And thank you to Senators Welch and Senators Vance, who have introduced legislation to fund the program through the end of the year with appropriations. They're both strong proposals to temporarily fund the program and give Congress time to find a long-term solution so we don't face this cliff every six months or every year. Now, the Universal Service Fund Working Group that I've been proud to be a part of and uh, lead with Ranking Member Thune has been working on a long-term solution. Once we save this program in short term, I believe, I'm looking forward to bringing a solution to this committee that provides a permanent funding mechanism, modernizing programs, looking at what the out years will certainly look like here to earn bipartisan support in both chambers. And I'm very proud that this working group has had participation 
from members of the Senate, members of the House, and members of leadership. Um, it's really been incredible to see how these thoughts and these ideas and embracing some of those differences actually shows where we agree on how to get this achieved. So I very much appreciate that. Now, it would be a significant waste of government funds to let this program lapse. It would mean letting all the time and resources the federal government and our state and local partners have put into standing up the program and enrolling 23 million households go to waste. I'm looking forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses who will provide clear evidence that we are on the brink of wasting significant federal investments and causing real harm to our constituents. Each will share their perspective on the role that the Affordable Connectivity Program plays in our economy and in the lives of low-income families across the country. Now, our panelists, we're going to hear from Ms. Jennifer Case Nevada, who is the Director and Lead Educator of Community Learning Network and member of the Broadband and Digital Equity Support Team for New Mexico and the Office of Broadband Access and Expansion. I'm proud that Ms. Nevada has joined us this morning all the way from Santa Fe, New Mexico, to share what she's seen on the ground and the importance of ACP and the consequences if we let it lapse. Ms. Catherine DeWitt, Project Director of the Broadband Access Initiative at the Pew Charitable Trust, who will speak to the economic importance of ACP to families across this country. Mr. Blair Levin, Policy Advisor at New Street Research and non-resident senior fellow at Brookings Metro, who will speak to the economic impact of a potential ACP lapse across our economy. And Dr. Paul Winfrey, President and CEO of the Economic Policy Innovation Center, who Ranking Member Thune will introduce. Now, I look forward to hearing from each of you, and I now want to recognize Ranking Member Thune for his opening statement. We're going to hear first from the Ranking Member of the full committee, um, Senator Cruz of Texas. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to Ranking Member Thune, and thank you to our witnesses today. The United States is the standard bearer for high-speed internet connectivity. During the pandemic, American internet providers significantly outperformed our more, more highly regulated European counterparts with faster and more competitive service. Yet this highly functioning industry is under relentless attack by the Biden administration. Despite being handed a generational opportunity to connect all Americans, this administration has made it clear they would prefer to assert government control of the internet. This was epitomized by last week's FCC party line vote to subject the broadband industry to an oppressive regulatory regime under the pretense of so-called net neutrality. This follows the FCC's digital equity power grab late last year, in which the agency asserted control over nearly every aspect of the broadband business and opened providers to expansive, indeterminate, and crippling liability under a disparate impact standard. The Biden administration claims that it wants to improve broadband affordability for American families, but the FCC is sabotaging these goals. What happens when companies need to divert significant resources to com towards complying with woke Biden priorities over their customers? Prices go up, investment and innovation declines, and Americans suffer. And we know this from experience. When the Obama FCC imposed Title II on broadband, their first iteration of net neutrality in early 2015, capital expenditures fell by $500 million that year and by another $2.7 billion in 2016. That hurts American consumers across the country. We see similar trends in the Biden administration's mismanagement of Congress's massive broadband investments, over $125 billion in the last four years. The Biden NTIA has prioritized woke social policies, union mandates, tech biases, and price controls at the expense of delivering high-speed internet to unserved Americans. The largest of these programs, a $42 billion broadband infrastructure program, is already being waylaid. Biden administration officials are withholding and delaying funding from states like Virginia, 
where Governor Youngkin's team is standing up to the coercive and lawless demands of the Biden administration. Likewise, the Affordable Connectivity Program is not working as Congress intended. To assist those for whom cost was the barrier to gaining internet access, ACP, which gives a $30 monthly subsidy for internet service and $75 per month if you're on tribal lands, was given a record $14 billion budget. This was anticipated to last several years. But the FCC deliberately oversubscribed the program, blowing through the money in record time. We have heard from the White House and from Chairman Rosenworcel that this massive welfare program should be considered a success because 23 million households enrolled in it. But it turns out the vast majority of these people already had high-speed internet. Here's an FCC survey showing that just 22% of the households receiving the taxpayer subsidy were previously unsubscribed to broadband. This means that for every household that didn't subscribe to premium internet, the federal government is subsidizing four households that did. Beyond this massive inefficiency and waste, reports have also found, unsurprisingly, that the ACP has had inflationary effects on the price of internet. One of our witnesses, Dr. Paul Winfrey, analyzed the data and found that in places where ACP enrollment is the highest, we see higher prices. A less technical but no less telling report from the National Review used archive records from the internet to show that companies treat the $30 subsidy now as the new price floor. Companies that used to offer broadband plans for $10 or $15 a month now charge $30 for the same or marginally upgraded service. History has shown that when the federal government starts subsidizing demand in higher education and agriculture, the subsidy gets capitalized and prices go up. After all, why would corporations ever leave free money on the table? While those who receive the subsidy may realize an immediate cost reduction, the market prices rise for everybody else. This rising price creates a call for more subsidies and higher taxes to fund those additional higher subsidies and eventually a government takeover of the internet to provide it for free. To the extent there are truly indigent people who cannot afford connectivity, there is a program already designed for them. It's called Lifeline. If it's not working well, we should look to improve it not to impose higher taxes on millions of hardworking Americans to cover the internet bills of their neighbors who are already willing and able to pay for it themselves. I'm open to a discussion on these reforms. The road to broadband as a publicly regulated utility is not one Americans can afford. To ensure that all Americans can access and benefit from high-speed connectivity, the administration should reverse course. Abandon toxic regulatory mandates, remove unnecessary barriers to investment, and ensure federal broadband subsidies are working as Congress intended. An innovative and an affordable broadband future can only be achieved if the federal government puts Americans' prosperity over its urge to assert regulatory control. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruz. I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Thune, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to work with you on the working group. I think there are a number of areas in the um, U U Universal Service Fund programs uh, that are have been needed oversight and reform and looking at ways that we can uh, make those work more efficiently. Uh, and so I look forward to our continued efforts in that regard. And, and uh, thank you for the having the hearing this morning. Thank you to all our witnesses for being here. Um, let me start by saying that uh, an internet connection provides significant opportunities to run a business, provide health care, or do homework. And as a member who represents a rural state, I remain committed to the bipartisan principle of universal service and ensuring that Americans in all parts of the country have access to communication services comparable in quality and price to those in urban areas. Today we're here to examine the state of broadband, uh, broadband affordability programs. 
The FCC has a long history with broadband affordability through its Lifeline program, as has been mentioned, which despite existing for nearly 40 years, has not been a broad success story. A carefully designed, properly administered broadband affordability program to help those Americans who without a subsidy would be unable to afford reasonable level of connectivity is an important part of universal service. But unfortunately, the FCC's Lifeline program, which is currently part of the Universal Service Fund, has not lived up to this promise. The rampant waste, fraud, and abuse within the Lifeline program has been well documented over the years. Unfortunately, much like the FCC's Lifeline program, the Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP, seems to be plagued with similar inefficiencies. ACP, what initially began as a program to help consumers stay connected during the pandemic, was expanded, as many government programs tend to be, into a much broader and much more expensive program. As is currently designed, ACP does a poor job of directing support to those who truly need it, namely those who would not get service without a subsidy. With overly broad eligibility criteria, ACP allows over 40% of American households to receive a subsidy. If all of the eligible households were enabled, or I should say were enrolled into ACP, the program would cost the taxpayer over $19 billion annually. The inefficiencies in both Lifeline and ACP are in large part a direct result of the FCC's failure to set performance goals and address the fundamental question of whether or not either of these programs are an effective means of increasing adoption among low-income consumers. Without performance goals, we have no evidence to support that ACP or Lifeline are effective in connecting non-subscribers to the internet. The FCC's own survey, Senator Cruz pointed out, indicates that at least, or I should say at best, about 22% of the current ACP subscribers did not have an internet connection prior to ACP. It is imperative that the FCC conduct such an analysis so that we can make informed decisions on the future of broadband affordability programs for truly low-income Americans. And simply saying 23 million households will lose broadband if ACP does not receive new funding is not undertaking a fundamental analysis. The American people deserve better, and we need an honest assessment of how to best deliver services to those actually in need. To that end, I appreciate Senator Lujan's work leading the USF Working Group with me and other members of this committee to address the needs and shortfalls of the US pro USF programs. We also must recognize the federal government will not solve the digital divide on its own. The United States' light regulatory or light touch regulatory approach to broadband policy has resulted in telecommunications providers in South Dakota and the rest of the country making network reliability, affordability, and resiliency a priority. During the pandemic, when demand for reliable internet soared, U.S. broadband providers were able to keep Americans connected, which was not the case in other countries. And now as ACP winds down, I appreciate how the private sector is stepping up, turning to low-income programs they offered prior to ACP. The White House and some in Congress have called on companies to continue offering free service to consumers despite ACP dollars running out. This, of course, is akin to rate regulation and demonstrates that Democrats, what Democrats have wanted all along. The efforts to promote quality and affordable broadband are under attack by the Biden FCC. Just last week, the FCC once again asserted broad new government powers over the Internet using rules that were designed for telephone monopolies back during the Great Depression. The last time these heavy-handed regulations were imposed, as Senator Cruz pointed out, broadband investment declined. And there's good reason to believe this will happen again. These new rules would also imperil the United States' position at the forefront of Internet innovation. Biden's FCC should be focused on addressing real challenges, such as reducing regulatory burdens and thus the cost for broadband, not searching for a problem where one doesn't exist. Before I close, I'd also like to add that I hope we can hear from the FCC directly about their broadband affordability programs and many other important issues. It's unacceptable that this committee has not held an oversight hearing of the FCC for over 1,400 days. I appreciate each of our witnesses for being here today and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, and Dr. Winfrey um, is our fourth witness. He's president and CEO of Economic Policy Innovation Center. 
He's an economist, trusted policy, uh, public policy advisor, and served in top management and policy roles in the White House, the U.S. Senate, and in think tanks. So it's great to have you here along with the rest of our panel of witnesses. We look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thune. And before I recognize myself for uh, five minutes of questions, I want to wish Peter Welch a uh, happy birthday. So if everyone might be able to just give him a round of applause, please, and show our appreciation to Senator Welch. Um, is a pretty nice guy, but I appreciate the embarrassment. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Ben Ray. <laughs> So before I recognize myself for questions, I want to make sure that we hear from our distinguished panel as well. Uh, so Ms. Navarez, um, you'll begin, and each of you will be recognized for five minutes as well. You'll be able to submit your full testimony into the record as well. Ms. Navarez, uh, you're recognized. Santa Fe, New Mexico, Senate Bill 1250. As director of Community Learning Network, an educational nonprofit dedicated to building stronger communities through real life learning, and a member of the broadband and digital equity support team for the New Mexico Office of Broadband, I have traversed the state, met with hundreds of constituents, and I'm here today to share community concerns and to highlight the urgent need for Congress to act now to extend ACP before it lapses completely. Though many think the internet is all about technology, it is actually about connecting people. A Dene Navajo elder I work with who lives on a fixed income on a farm in rural New Mexico, with the end of ACP and broadband access and affordability out of reach for many rural uh, residents, she and many others like her will go without internet connectivity at home. And in her case, will do what she has done before to get online drive 52 miles to check her email at the public library. With the end of ACP, more than 23 million households are now at risk of losing their internet connectivity. Nearly half are military families, and 10 million are over the age of 50, with seniors reporting that they rely heavily on the internet to coordinate and track medical services, overcome isolation, and deal with the fact that they may no longer be able to drive. 320,000 are households on tribal lands where high-speed internet is generally more expensive. In New Mexico, more than 184,000 households face losing their ability to pay bills, purchase goods, check health portals, run small businesses, and do work or schoolwork online. In Congressional District 2, 28% of all households are enrolled in ACP. So one of every four households are now at risk of losing connectivity. This is a terrible blow to the local economy and a terrible setback for local families and the counties where they live. With families facing hard decisions about what to cut, finding an affordable alternative is not easy, especially in rural areas where there may only be one provider, where costs can be much higher and where low cost options may be unreliable or inadequate for whole families working or learning from home. As the fifth largest state and the sixth lowest in population density, deploying fiber in New Mexico is extra costly. Subscriber pools are smaller and more scattered, and networks are difficult to maintain. For us in New Mexico, for our economy, for our health, for the well-being of our families, our communities, and our internet service providers, every subscriber counts. Sus subscribers are especially critical for our small tribal and rural communities who have leveraged investments and built networks and companies to provide valuable internet service in hard to reach areas where they are often the only option. These local providers often run on tight margins with higher expenses to serve low density areas with lower income customers. They are at a higher risk of bankruptcy without a reliable and consistent pool of active subscribers. Thanks to collaborative investment and ACP outreach, local networks and providers have been building relationships and trust while growing their customer base. The end of ACP now, after just over two years of getting going, and the loss of subscribers puts the BEAD initiatives in jeopardy, and some local networks at risk of failure, especially in areas that are most in need and serving some of the hardest to reach and traditionally underserved, disconnected community members. We cannot overlook the massive investment and administrative burden of standing up ACP and coordinating more than 1,500 internet service providers and 23 million subscribers through enrollment. 
To let ACP die now feels wasteful and irresponsible. To let it lapse feels short-sighted and irreverent of both its current success, 23 million subscribers in just over two years, and the massive investment of time, energy, and money by everyone. Right now, confusion abounds. Congress is losing credibility, and local service providers are losing customers and public trust. So what now? Are we really going to let 23 million households drop out of the internet economy and disappear from the digital world? Mayors and governors, both Republicans and Democrats, have publicly prioritized ACP and made it a part of their plan to close the digital divide. Affordable, reliable internet is more than a bipartisan issue. It is a people issue with real world impact on health and wealth for Americans. Moreover, it is rare but inspiring when government, community, and industry align. So why align? As aptly noted by one of our leaders in the community, broadband is everybody's business. Broadband is an essential service for everyone. ACP was established and to address the critical needs to connect everyone, and 23 million enrollment was a monumental feat and a success we should not waste. Meanwhile, ACP use is widespread and directly impacts our constituents. Urban, suburban, and rural communities rely on ACP to pay for the high-speed internet service they need for school, work, healthcare, essential services, and more. Most importantly, we all lose when ACP ends. The end of ACP puts networks, local ISPs, and bead infrastructure investment at risk and erodes public trust. Since we just got started, quitting now would be a waste. In closing, I echo the understanding that people and places thrive when everyone can participate. Economies thrive when everyone can participate. So I ask everyone in this room, do you use a cell phone, computer, or laptop? Do you have internet access right now? As we face the end of ACP, I would like you to join more than 23 million households in an experiment. Turn off your devices and go without using internet for the next five minutes, five hours, or five days. Yes, give it a try while reflecting on how the rest of your day and life will be impacted. Let's n let this sink in, and then let's not let more than 23 million households and families disappear from the digital economy. Congress has the power to act now to keep those constituents connected. And I am here to remind you today that the health and well-being of Americans, as well as the economic vitality and security of our nation, depend on it. Ranking Member Cruz, uh, Chairman Lujan, and Ranking Member Thune, as well as members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for inviting me to testify in today's hearing. Also, a very happy birthday to Senator Welch. My name is Catherine DeWitt, and I am the Project Director for the Broadband Access Initiative at the Pew Charitable Trusts. Pew is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, evidence-based organization, and for more than 75 years, we have used data to make a difference. My team works directly with broadband offices from 36 states and territories to help them navigate this unprecedented moment, the largest federal investment in affordable broadband access in our nation's history. The Affordable Connectivity Program, also known as ACP, is essential to this work. Achieving universal broadband requires two things. First are supply-side solutions, steps that, that reduce the cost of building networks and delivering service to American homes. Second are demand-side interventions that reduce the cost of broadband for consumers, particularly low-income and vulnerable households. We tried, if you build it, they will come. But, COVID, but the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated why that approach will not get us to the finish line. We witnessed in real time how tens of millions of Americans struggle, struggled to work, learn, and access healthcare because they did not have reliable or high-quality internet. Why? For some, it was too expensive. For others, it was simply unavailable. Congress took swift action to address this, including dedicating funding to immediately bring vulnerable households online, and it worked. 23 million households participate in the ACP today, including almost half, um, and almost half of those families are military families, and 19% are 65 and older. In Texas alone, 1.7 million households benefit from the program. In Michigan, more than 410,000 households are enrolled. 
These numbers are a remarkable testament to the response from internet service providers, the public sector, and community partners across the country. Second, Congress established two important deployment initiatives, the Capital Projects Fund and the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, also known as BEAD. But for the first time, Congress addressed those supply and demand barriers together by conditioning eligibility for deployment grants on participation in an affordability program. In other words, Congress took steps to ensure that $52 billion in taxpayer funds would support networks that would be available and affordable to consumers, whether they were rural, veterans, or aging Americans living on a fixed income. ACP is currently the best tool we have to bridge the digital divide because it alleviates cost burden on households and increases certainty for the providers that we need to connect every American. In fact, all 50 states have incorporated ACP into their de deployment strategies for capital projects and BEAD. States are actively administering these programs right now. But ACP's potential end is introducing risk to states, providers, and consumers at a critical moment in implementation. We all know that broadband is complicated. States have expressed concerns about a range of challenges from permitting to workforce shortages. But for more than a year, state broadband offices have raised alarms about the end of ACP, and providers of all types have expressed hesitation about participating in BEAD if ACP goes away. That is why we ask Congress to act quickly and decisively to keep ACP funded. Ohio's digital equity plan notes that the end of ACP will abruptly disrupt access to affordable internet that low-income Ohioans rely on for education, work, and health care. That concern is echoed by other program recipients. A recent survey found that 68% of enrolled military families were concerned about missing out on job opportunities. 72% of enrolled Americans over 65 are worried about losing access to health care. 95% of all participants said they would struggle with other household costs, including groceries, utilities, housing, and health care. ACP should be improved to better reach house, the households that need it and ensure that taxpayers are being protected from waste, fraud, and abuse. We must extend ACP at the next legislative opportunity if we want $52 billion in taxpayer money to support broadband that Americans can use for access to education, health care, job opportunities, and more. There is no time to waste. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeWitt. Mr. Levin, you're recognized for your opening statement. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Lujan, Ranking Member Alch, uh, other members of the subcommunity, uh, thank you for inviting me to today's hearing. My name is Blair Levin. I'm an equity analyst with New Street Research and a non resident fellow at Brookings, but I'm speaking solely for myself. Today, I'd like to explain why ACP should be extended and then, as part of a larger Universal Service Fund reform, be maintained with whatever modifications Congress deems wise. First, the cost of digital exclusion is already large and growing, with AI certain to magnify those costs. In 2010, the National Broadband Plan documented how the cost of digital exclusion was large and growing. In March 2020, the United States, in an overwhelmingly bipartisan manner, saw that cost and agreed it was unacceptable. The pandemic has largely ended, but the shift to online delivery of essential services and the need for connectivity to participate in the economy has not and the coming wave of AI will magnify those costs. Second, despite that knowledge, our country is about to take the greatest step backwards any country has ever taken to widen, not close, the digital divide. Uh, third, the cost of that disconnection will be extraordinarily painful to individuals and families. My fellow witnesses have already testified to how ACP recipients would be harmed by the program's demise. I will not repeat their powerful testimony. Instead, I will focus on the cost to all of us. And that leads me to the fourth point. Digital uh, disconnection will impose an immediate cost on our economy, shrinking economic growth. My written testimony cites studies demonstrating how the program increases earnings for low-income households and increases GDP. It is no surprise, therefore, that business groups overwhelmingly support the extension. Fifth, the loss of the ACP will raise the cost of government-provided health care and worsen health care uh, outcomes. Numerous studies demonstrate that telehealth can lower costs and improve outcomes in many circumstances, including cancer, maternal uh, mortality, opioid treatment, and emergency room visits. 
ACP opens the door to improving health care outcomes while lowering costs for Medicaid, Medicare, and the VA. Alternatively, the end of ACP is likely to cause increased health care costs and worse health outcomes. Why would we want to do that? Sixth, the loss of ACP will raise the cost of government and diminish its performance in other areas as well. The story of broadband and health care is repeated in other areas where government is the key investor, including job training, job placement, education, and other social services. This is not surprising. Broadband is a general purpose technology. It enables innovations and efficiencies in multiple areas. In 2013, Google's chief economist estimated that the internet already generated $500 in consumer surplus per user annually, citing multiple different kinds of savings. And it logically follows that because many low-income households are so dependent on government programs, the consumer surplus that ACP recipients obtain also creates a surplus for, those, for the government through those programs. So again, why would we want our investments to be less effective and more expensive? Seventh, the loss of ACP will particularly hurt rural areas and military families. Have others have noted rural areas in particular benefit from ACP? I cite several in my written testimony. Let me illustrate with one more. Rural areas are suffering from a growing epidemic of hospital closures, and that makes uh, telehealth even more essential. And as Ms. DeWitt noted, losing ACP would reduce the value of B deployment dollars meaning that communities that could have been connected to fiber will end up connected with fixed wireless or even satellites. Eighth, every negative consequence I've mentioned will be made worse as AI becomes embedded in our economy and society. Ninth, the administrative cost of shutting down and starting up again is high. It will be a huge waste to shut ACP down and incur, as we would inevitably do, the startup costs again. In sum, losing ACP will result in slower economic growth, increases in the cost of healthcare, education, job training and placement, and other social services, while decreasing the effectiveness of those services. I know I'm a Democratic witness, but let me just close by endorsing the letter 20 House Republicans sent Speaker Johnson asking for action on ACP, saying bipartisan solutions are within reach to ensure uninterrupted access to the ACP while concurrently pursuing long-term funding strategies. I completely agree. Let's adopt a clean extension and then reform the entire Universal Service Fund to put it and ACP on a sustainable basis. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Levin. Thank you very much. Dr. Winfrey, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Lujan, Ranking Member Thune, members of the committee. I was thinking about using my five minutes to sing happy birthday to Senator Welsh, but I don't think anybody wants that. So. Uh, like the development of canals and railroads in the 19th century and highways in the 20th century, access to affordable high-speed internet will determine regional development as well as America's ability to continue to grow by leading the world in innovation. Fortunately, policymakers have paid an incredible amount of attention to the issue of broadband affordability over the past decade. This has led to many new re policies that we can use as guidance. These policies include deregulation as well as subsidizing the demand for high-speed internet and the supply of internet service providers or ISPs. We have learned that deregulation and competition have reduced prices. We have also learned that policies subsidizing demand can increase prices if they do not fundamentally change the demand for high-speed internet or the supply of ISPs. Experience has demonstrated that deregulation can produce significant gains for consumers, especially when it enhances transparency by increasing the scale on which providers can compete on price and the quality of services. One recent case of how deregulation reduced prices was in 2017 when Congress nullified a rule enacted by the FCC regarding consumer data sharing. Before the FCC's 2016 rule, companies designed plans that allowed consumers to opt in or out of data sharing at different subscription rates. Those who chose to opt in paid lower rates than those who decided to opt out. But in 2016, the FCC enacted a rule requiring consumers to opt in. Congress nullified this rule using the Congressional Review Act process. The results created more options at different price points for consumers. The 2020 Economic Report of the President found that the CRA reduced wireless prices by more than 10% and wired prices by as much as 2%. At the same time, subsidizing demand can increase prices, especially when the unemployment rate is high and the underlying inflation rate is high as well. Or excuse me, unemployment rate is low and the underlying inflation rate is high. There are several ways that the federal government subsidizes the demand for broadband. 
One such program is the Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP, which provides a monthly subsidy of $30 to low-income households, as well as a $100 one-time subsidy to buy a tablet, laptop, or desktop computer. Economic theory, as Senator Cruz uh, mentioned earlier, would predict that a demand subsidy can act as a price floor, especially in a market where the demand and supply of a product remain relatively fixed. In this environment, the producer, in this case the ISPs, will caption a portion, if not all, of the subsidy. In a recent paper, I found that there is a positive relationship between the percentage of households receiving ACP su subsidies and the increase in the average total monthly price for broadband. Importantly, I do not find any statistically meaningful association between ACP subsidies and prices when the level of households receiving subsidies is under 7%, but today about 15% of households across the country receive an ACP subsidy. That corresponds with an average increase of about 7% in the total cost of a monthly broadband su subscription. These estimates do not change even when factoring in the market concentration of ISPs. Based on the estimates in this paper, the average cost of broadband is about $5.48 per month higher because of ACP, implying that ISPs are capturing about 18% of the total subsidy. If 40% of households were enrolled in ACP, as would be the case under the Biden administration's enrollment proposal, the average change in prices for plans would be about $9.39. We've seen how ISPs can offer choices to consumers and pass along savings through lower prices in a competitive market when they are not heavily regulated. The same could be true under a more competitive market post-ACP. Subsidizing demand through ACP also makes consumers less sensitive to prices and quality. This advantages large existing ISPs who are more likely to have had existing market share when the program was created. If AC funding were to become exhausted, companies would be encouraged to compete for consumers shopping for better plans. In fact, according to Communications Daily, most ISPs have already told their investors that when ACP ends, they don't plan to lose any money because they will be, com be competing on price and quality to attract consumers who are coming off of subsidized coverage. Just in the last week alone, we saw a major ISP offer a $9.95 uh, plan uh, that wasn't being offered again before the exhaustion of ACP funding was on the horizon. Ultimately, this will benefit everyone by creating a more sustainable, affordable marketplace for high-speed internet. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Winfrey. <clears throat> I'm not gonna recognize myself for five minutes of questions, and Ms. Tavares, I'm gonna begin with you. Again, thank you for traveling from New Mexico to be with us today and for your work over many years to connect every New Mexican to broadband. Now, Ms. Tavares, yes or no from what you have seen and who you have worked with on the ground, would students be negatively impacted by a lapse in the affordable connectivity program? I'll add in all capital letters, <laughs> being would, a teacher at heart. <laughs> would veterans be negatively impacted? Yes. Would seniors be negatively impacted? Yes. Would those who live in our tribal communities be negatively impacted? Yes. Would those who live in rural areas be negatively impacted? Yes. I appreciate those responses. Now, Mr. Witt, can you please briefly provide a perspective from your research on which populations will be the most affected? At this point, we know that um, nearly uh, one-fifth of ACP households include uh, seniors age 65 and older. Um, and uh, based on the research that we can do, uh, we know that any changes to the program will have an adverse effect on Americans over 50 as well as veterans. What I would add is that we need better data and more transparency on enrollment and about the trends in population in order to fully understand how changes to the program would have a negative effect on the vulnerable households that it's attempting to serve. Appreciate that. Mr. Levin, you noted in your testimony that the digital divide puts strain on our healthcare system. You also noted that the Affordable Connectivity Program not only helps people access their healthcare online, but also that increased use of telemedicine creates enormous cost savings for our health system. You referenced a study by the University of Pennsylvania that telemedicine was 23% less expensive for health systems to deliver compared to in-person visits. Many of the most vulnerable populations who utilize the Affordable Connectivity Program 
are also participants in Medicare or Medicaid, or are veterans who receive their health care through the VA. So that 23% savings is a significant cost savings for the government. Mr. Levin, from your research, from what you've seen, is it possible that the economic benefit of the affordable connectivity program to the healthcare system are greater than the cost of the government of administering to the government than uh, uh, administering the program? Healthcare economists, but I believe the answer to be yes. And if it's not true today, it's going to be true sometime in the very near future. What we saw immediately in the wake of the pandemic was that um, healthcare started accelerating its movement to telehealth. I believe in February of 2020, 1% of Medicare care visits were um, over telehealth. In April, it was like 70%. That was inevitable, but it started to accelerate. And then efficiencies grow in. So it's almost inevitable that um, uh, if not today, at some time in the near future, um, internet access can actually save money for those programs. So on that same note, do you believe that between healthcare, employment, and education, investing in the affordable connectivity program may actually result in a cost savings, a net cost savings uh, to the government? Yes. Now, for example, on the job training and job placement, we find that people who have internet access get jobs faster, as you would expect. And then they spend less time on unemployment savings to the government. I appreciate that. Now, Ms. Tavares, you noted in your testimony that without the reliable customer base that the Affordable Connectivity Program also provides, some of New Mexico's small local internet service providers or ISPs are at risk of going bankrupt. When a small local provider in a rural area in New Mexico goes bankrupt, what happens to their customer base and can, can they just find a new provider? service. And in rural New Mexico, finding an alternate provider is very difficult. Actually, uh, these networks didn't exist. If they were easy, we would have built them already. So when a small rural community builds a network, there's often no competition or little to no competition. So for those small providers, if they go bankrupt or fail, those customers lose service and Oftentimes, the small government offices, the local regional government offices, and community anchor institutions that also use that network fail. And I would add as well, in New Mexico, we have 22 tribes that are building their own networks. Not only do they build them, they are running them. And they have trained local community members. So the local workforce also loses out because those um, community members who've been trained as fiber technicians, those jobs go away. And those community members either have to find an alternate job in rural New Mexico is not always easy. They have to travel further or move to the city. Um, just a shout out. Our state has been tenaciously working on that, and we're proud to report over 200 fiber optic technicians, with 80% of them being native or Hispanic, have been trained in the last two years to run their own networks. 70% of those had some college but no college degree. It's very exciting. I appreciate that. Next, we will hear from Senator Vance. Senator Vance, you recognized for five minutes for your questions. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Chair. appreciate you and uh, appreciate all of you for being here. I, I wanted to sort of focus my questions on, um, you know, the, the sort of economic impacts from the consumer's perspective, but also uh, from the, the governments and also the sort of the businesses that are investing in broadband infrastructure. And Mr. Levin, I'd like to direct my questions um, to, to, to you. So, you know, I, 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 in your written testimony, you described the positive impact on employment rates from discount internet plans. And you sort of explain how greater labor force participation and so forth comes from, you know, having access to high quality broadband. I know that's an issue, especially in our rural communities, but of course it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue in a lot of different communities as well. Um, I'd like to sort of understand, how do you think about the cost savings, right? The, one of the biggest challenges that we have when it comes to refunding the ACP program and reauthorizing it, which I, I support, uh, is, you know, of course, the pushback that we are in sort of tight budgetary times. We have to think about how to save money in this town, which is something we do uh, far too little of. Uh, could you just help me think about the economic upsides of the ACP program as you understand it? Um, what, what do we gain from investing in this program? Um, there are multiple different ways of, of thinking about it. I cited in my oral testimony a study by a Google economist who talked about consumer surpluses 
2013 being $500 per user. That number undoubtedly has gone up. And if you look at the study, there's just all kinds of different ways in which savings of time, I think all of us have experienced the internet is able to do certain things to speed up, able to shop, uh, able to determine uh, the most, the, the, um, the cheapest option for a product that we want. There are those kinds of savings that accrue directly to um, an individual. But what we also see is, particularly in terms of the government, which is in a way sharing in those costs, um, in, the, in the case of telehealth, there's very direct savings because if you save one emergency room visit by having the person come on broadband and talk to someone and if, and if they turn out not to go to the emergency room because they don't really need to, I believe that's like a $3,000 savings in, in terms of time. I mentioned earlier in terms of job training and placement, there's direct benefit to the government, not just to the person, but to the government. Um, I think if we look at education and my God, what AI is going to do to education, I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to be great. But if the very people we most want to be able to use those tools to learn how to read and reading scores in fourth grade are a great predictor of economic success later on in life, um, that's another version of those kind of savings. So, so Mr. Levin, have you ever done any sort of um, analysis of the, of the net benefits? So if you take, for example, a dollar spent on the ACP, you know, what is, what is the, the benefit in terms of government savings from things like, you know, Medicare diverting people into telehealth, which saves uh, a lot of money, but also consumer um, upside? Have you ever sort of tried to understand the net effect of, you know, the given amount that we spend on the ACP? Yeah. Others are much better than that, uh, better, better than me at that. My, my friend in the, probably the leading expert on that kind of data is a guy named John Horrigan, who estimated that for every dollar spent, there's $2 of gain to the individual. Uh, there was a study that said for every dollar spent on ACP, we get a $3.89 uh, increase in GDP. Um, I have not done a comprehensive, nor do I believe there is a comprehensive study on healthcare. Sure. I sure wish there was. Yep. Uh, I think it's uh, something which the government should do. But it's really about a kind of a larger trend in which we take advantage of this incredible opportunity to rethink how we deliver services. Yep. And there's almost no doubt yep. that, when, particularly when we come to healthcare, you'd see a benefit. Great. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, of course, be very interested in that too. Um, so one, one just final question is, you know, when I talk to, you know, obviously we talked about the consumer side of this and the, the government side of this. Um, when I've talked to a number of businesses who invest in rural broadband, and obviously it's, you know, very expensive to lay a mile of fiber right. in southeastern Ohio compared mm -hmm. to central Ohio, where it's a lot more densely populated, the terrain's a little bit, you know, okay. less tough and so forth. Um, you know, one of the things that sort of justifies the very large capital expenditure of that infrastructure uh, is knowing that they're going to be customers on the other end. And that's something the ACP program in ensures. Could you speak to sort of that economic benefit a little bit? Yeah, BCG did a study which suggests that the bead dollars go 25% further if you have ACP for precisely the reason you just said, that if you have a guaranteed um, population that you know is going to pay, and they're going to pay on a regular basis, and one of the mistakes people make is they say only 22% uh, had uh, didn't have broadband. Actually, there were a lot of people who were on broadband and off broadband. That's the largest group. Sure. But if you know you're going to have that population, you need less of a government subsidy uh, to build out that network. Yeah, and I'm, I'm mindful of my time here, so, so I'll yield. But just one observation, you know, um, anecdotally, which is not always data, but I do think it's useful, is I, I've talked to a number of folks uh, who have invested a lot in rural broadband infrastructure in the state of Ohio who have told me straightforwardly they would not have made that investment if not for the existence of the ACP program. So I think something important for us to keep in mind as we think about how to build out uh, the 21st century digital infrastructure for our country. So uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Senator Clote, which are your recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you for the work. Happy birthday to Senator Welch. Um, nice day for a birthday. Um, I uh, want to actually uh, thank um, him and um, to Senator Vance for their work um, on making sure that we uh, continue uh, getting funding for the Affordable Connectivity Program Extension Act. Um, and we all know this is an ongoing problem right now um, and that uh, Chair Cantwell has been working 
um, to include this funding for ACP. So I think it's really important to make the case that I know you have all been doing throughout this hearing about what this means. And I want to focus especially on um, some of the issues in uh, rural America in my state right now. So um, we know that rural communities are particularly in need of support uh, to make broadband available at affordable prices. I've heard from first grade teachers. Uh, we had during the pandemic, some of the numbers were 20, 30, 40% in some of our counties that while some of the kids were able to access, um, including community college classes via the internet, other ones just were given paper and pencil and they're like workbooks every single day. It was a complete um, disconnect. Um, Mr. Levin, do you agree that programs like ACP can help incentivize providers to serve high cost areas? 5% differential. And um, Ms. DeWitt, you note that the challenge of building out broadband networks is distinct from making sure consumers can afford to access those networks. Can you discuss how the expiration of ACP could impact the investments that we're making in broadband infrastructure? Absolutely. Uh, and what we know to be true is that uh, right now, households that are unserved are currently uh, the most expensive and difficult to serve. Uh, for example, um, the cost per passing in Minnesota using capital project dollars is $7,300 per location. Uh, without ACP, our bead uh, connect connections will be even more expensive. Uh, so we will see the increase of those costs per passing um, move up without that ACP support. Rural providers, particularly those in Minnesota who have been the backbone of ensuring robust and affordable connectivity throughout the state, um, simply may not be able to shoulder the cost, um, both of the capital deployment as well as the operations without that subsidy. Exactly, thank you. Um, the, I mentioned education. There was one mom in Sibley County, Minnesota, who told us uh, that she's worried her kids aren't gonna be able to complete their homework if she can't get the access. And Mr. Levin, you note that students without home internet uh, have lower grades and complete homework less often. Talk about why ACP is important to get at that. Um, that, study that, that came to that conclusion, but it makes total intuitive sense that um, my, my sister actually is a school teacher and um, many years ago she kind of blamed me for the fact that half of her students had internet and half of her students didn't and it was a really big problem for her. Um, and that's a problem we're gonna see if ACP goes away. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it just that, as all of us do when we are writing various things or trying to solve various problems, we now depend on the internet to give us the information we need. Uh, it also helps in writing in a variety of ways. So um, the students are no different than the rest of us in that regard. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Navarez, can you discuss how uh, you've seen affordable internet open up uh, educational opportunities in your work leading the community learning network? I am actually a certificated teacher, so learning is important. In our state, when COVID hit, many students were struggling. We actually had students, like you mentioned, on, on paper and pen or trying to do homework with a cell phone. Um, in our case, many that of... Sounds like a lot of the senators, but it's, continue on. Yes. Okay. Um, I think the, the, the best thing is to share the example. Would you want your own children whether they're in middle school, high school, college, to have to do their term papers with old fashioned encyclopedias or be able to compete by accessing information and participating online. Every one of us use these tools daily. We're used to it and we don't realize how difficult it is. In our state, without home access, and for many of our communities, without the income to afford it and to have reliable and affordable internet, they can't do a class online. Zoom calls take broadband uh, strength. And they're driving to the community anchor institutions to sit in a hot car or a cold car if it's snowing to try to compete with their fellow classmates and to um, complete assignments. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for all your work in this area as well in leadership. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Next, we're gonna hear from the ranking member of the full committee, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Winfrey, you note in your testimony that one proven way to promote broadband affordability is through competition. 
according to a recent study by Econ One, competition from 5G fixed wireless service and home broadband markets was shown to produce billions per year in consumer savings. These are precisely the competitive benefits that the Spectrum Pipeline Act, which I introduced in partnership with Senators Thune and Blackburn, would provide. Unfortunately, instead of expanding access to mid-band spectrum and promoting competition from wireless services, the Biden administration has engaged in anti-competitive technology bias while stalling out on spectrum. Dr. Winfrey, in your judgment, how would my spectrum pipeline legislation compare to the ACP in promoting long-term broadband affordability? Spectrum auctions would increase competition and bring more folks into the market. We would have more ISPs doing more cool things with them, which would ultimately reduce prices. And lower prices, in turn, benefits consumers. That's right. Benefits everybody. And higher prices, which the ACP has produced, that's hurting consumers. Is that right? That's right. I mean, one of the issues with ACP is that it's a one-size-fits-all policy. It's a $30 monthly subsidy, regardless of where that person sits. And one of the things that we've seen is that ACP has predominantly covered folks living in urban areas relative to rural areas. So ACP is not a solution for rural areas, assuming that, that rural broadband connectivity is an issue, which I think that it is. And I think that there's a lot that we can ultimately do there, which uh, begs the question, well, why don't we use this as an opportunity to reform ACP? Well, and I'll Millions of people across Texas and across the country are hurting from inflation, inflation that has been galloping in the last three and a half years, particularly when Democrats had unified control of Congress and the White House, where they spent trillions of dollars we didn't have. They printed money we didn't have. They borrowed money from China we didn't have. They're producing inflation that is hurting working families across the country. And we now have Democrats coming back saying we want to spend billions more even though it will fuel inflation and it will drive up the cost for consumers across the board. Is that right? That's right. So there are two ways that ACP affects prices. The first way that it affects prices is by setting essentially a price floor for plans. Uh, what my research shows is that th that predominantly hits, again, urban areas. So what we saw before ACP is a bunch of plans that were, say, 20 up, 20 down, $10 a month. Those went away during ACP, right? So the the speed levels went up moderately, but the price level went from $10 to $30 because that's where the AC benchmark is. So all those cheap plans went away. And then the second way that ACP affects inflation is uh, through government through government spending. I mean, right now we've seen, you know, we're, we live in an economic environment where the Fed is having a really difficult time getting inflation under control. Uh, interest rates on short-term debt are five and a half percent. And so every dollar that is spent by the federal government is ultimately inflationary right now. So and are consumers better off at being able to get broadband at $10 or $30? $10. It's pretty remarkable. All right, let's shift to another topic. Dr. Winfrey, in your testimony, you raise that there are other low-income broadband subsidies in addition to ACP. In fact, as we've heard, uh, there are multiple taxpayer subsidies for internet connectivity. G GAO recently identified over 130 of them. The longest standing of these uh, it, are the Universal Service Funds programs at the FCC. Mm -hmm. I don't think we would be having this conversation about broadband affordability if the FCC were properly managing the Universal Service Fund programs. Dr. Winfrey, aren't some of these FCC programs demand side subsidies and, and what do these programs spend on a yearly basis? Sure, they're both demand side subsidies and then they're also su supply side subsidies. So there are four main programs. There's Lifeline, the high cost program, schools and libraries or, or E-rate and then rural health care. And together those four programs spend about $9 billion a year. And, and yet, uh, according to at least some members of this committee, the FCC needs yet another program why not fix the current programs and take the, the, the lessons the ACP has learned and apply them to making sure the funding we actually have works? This is what I proposed uh, in my blueprint for universal service fund reform. 
In your view, Dr. Winfrey, what changes should Congress consider making to ACP and the Universal Service Fund before adding additional funding to any of these programs? Sure. I think there are a number of reforms that can be added. I mean, we can learn from the experience of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, uh, premium tax credits uh, went to low-income individuals, and we learned that folks who were receiving those tax credits shouldn't have actually been receiving those tax credits. And so one of the things that, uh, that Congress can do is it can, can uh, learn from that experience to actually recapture uh, ACP funds that should be used for low-income populations. It's probably going to folks who are making much more than two times the federal poverty line. Uh, another option that the FCC IG has explored is uh, requiring social security numbers for the receipt of ACP benefits to make sure that, uh, again, folks who uh, are entitled to the program are actually receiving the benefit and that the benefits are not going to folks who, who, shouldn't, who shouldn't be receiving, uh, receiving those benefits. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned before, ACP's, one of ACP's main problems is that it's this universal program. It's a one-size-fits-all issue. And if, if ACP funding uh, should expire and Congress should um, uh, uh, begin thinking about how to reform some of these underlying programs, uh, it needs to take those regional differences into account, right? The issues that we see in New Mexico versus Minnesota versus Texas are, are all different, and these one-size approaches just don't work. We've learned that time and time again. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Cruz. Next, we'll hear from Senator Peters. You're recognized for questions. Well, first of all, I just want to thank our witnesses. Uh, thank you uh, for being here today. And I also want to thank uh, Chair, uh, Chair Lujan. Uh, thank you for holding uh, this hearing. And I think this uh, hearing uh, is extremely timely because uh, uh, almost one million Michigan households are on the precipice of uh, losing the Affordable Connectivity Program, which was passed by Congress uh, two years ago. And, as we all know, it helps uh, eligible families afford the internet. And in today's world, the internet is, is not a luxury, it's, uh, it's a necessity. And it's one that should be affordable to all Americans. And I believe that Congress must uh, do its job and fund this critical program as soon as possible, or 16% of American households are gonna face uh, internet shutoff or rate hikes. Uh, and as a supporter of the Affordable Connectivity Program Extension Act, uh, I'm going to keep fighting for funding, and I challenge all my colleagues, uh, including those on the other side of the aisle, to, uh, to do the same. Mr. Witt, my first question uh, is uh, for you. Uh, in, in your testimony, you mentioned how the Affordable Connectivity Program is closely linked to the state's ongoing plans for bead uh, deployment. My state of Michigan received uh, nearly $1.6 in bead funding, the fourth highest uh, allocation in the nation to close the digital divide and to bring high-speed internet to every corner of Michigan, which is both uh, urban, suburban, and vast uh, tracts of uh, rural uh, areas uh, as well. Uh, Mr. Witt, can you speak to how it would impact the BEADS program ability to reach every underserved and unserved location if uh, ACP is lapsed? And, and additionally, do you think uh, that ACP's lapse could impact BEAD participants' decisions as to where to apply for funding and how far they can reach uh, with their uh, proposed projects? Uh, I'll answer your second question first, which is yes, I do believe that ACP's lapse would affect uh, an internet service provider's decision to participate in BEAD uh, because they have said that. And uh, that's why it's important to ensure that we provide internet service providers with that certainty. Um, with respect to the bead program writ large, um, in short, we need every single dollar uh, to connect uh, unserved and underserved Americans across this country. As you outlined, Michigan is one of the states that uh, has a complicated problem ahead of them. Um, and thankfully, it has a very uh, well-run uh, broadband office and a um, strong strategy. Um, but I think that the important consideration is that BEAD and ACP were designed to work together. They are designed to work in tandem to defray the costs of building networks, whether we are looking at urban, rural, or suburban communities. Um, and uh, because Congress requires ACP uh, to participate in AC, um, uh, requires uh, ISPs to participate in ACP to receive bead funding. This means that we uh, are providing them with the surety of a guaranteed customer base, decreased churn, uh, and long-term retention. Very good. 
Mr. Wood, um, as you well know, the, uh, the Universal Service Fund has long been a tool for connecting Americans uh, to voice service uh, and to broadband access. However, the USF has not been modernized to account for today's uh, needs related to universal broadband service. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a proud member of the bipartisan USF working group uh, led by Senators uh, Lou Hahn and uh, Thune. And we have made progress uh, towards a long-term bipartisan solution that will enable the uh, USF to uh, support broadband accessibility and affordability for all consumers. And, you know, one of my top priorities as a member of uh, this working group with uh, Chair Lujan is to find a long-term sustainable funding mechanism for ACP so Americans never have to face another program cliff like the one that we uh, have right now. We have enough cliffs that we have to deal with. We don't need this one uh, as well. So my question for you is, can you speak to the importance of finding a way to sustainably fund ACP in the long term, such as through modernizing uh, the Universal Service Fund? Well, Pew does not have uh, research on uh, solutions for the modernization of the Universal uh, Service Fund at this time. Um, we do know that it is needed, and it is needed for all of the reasons that you just outlined, which is why we appreciate the work of you and others um, on that bipartisan and bicameral working group to identify one, um, including incorporating the ACP into that program. Um, however, um, universal service reform will take time. It will take time to come to agreement, and moreover, it will take time to implement. <coughs> we don't have the luxury of time at this moment. ACP is running out of money, and BEAD, uh, per, uh, potential BEAD participants, states, ISPs, communities, we are putting uh, their connectivity solutions at risk by delaying, which is why we ask that you provide the bridge to ACP today and continue work on USF in the future. Right. Well, thank you for your answers, uh, Chair Lujan. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Senator Peters. And I want to thank Senator Capito as well. Mr. Wald, you'll be recognized next for five minutes. Thanks for uh, getting here early. Uh, thank you very much. You know, we have got an urgent, immediate situation that has to be addressed, and that's the expiration of the ACP. And there's two points that I want to make. Number one, every witness here has acknowledged that the debate about whether everybody needs the internet is over. It is over. And a lot of us, Ben Ray, you and I, uh, were arguing pre-COVID for rural America to get internet just like rural America got electricity in the 30s. That was not an economic decision that was made because it didn't have business sense to have our companies extending uh, electricity in rural areas where there wasn't a big return, but it was a social decision, and we made that, and a lot of us were pushing for it. When COVID came, it made the case for us, because you couldn't go to work, your kids couldn't do homework, you couldn't get a medical appointment. And this Congress, on a bipartisan basis, really put enormous money into building it out. That doesn't do any good for folks if they can't get connected to it. And I've listened to the, so that's number one. We've got to have it. We've got to have it, and we all know that. And that's a red state or blue state. It just doesn't matter. The citizens we represent need it. Second, there's a lot of folks who are on the margin. And the ACP, if it goes out now, a lot of those folks are going to have to make very tough decisions. You know, example in Vermont, some woman making 15000 with two kids, single parent. She has got a hard job trying to figure out how to make ends meet and has to make real sacrifices, sometimes in the food budget. But she'll do it because she wants her kid to be able to do the homework. Or a grandparent who wants to stay in touch with grandchildren or their kids. And we've heard very compelling arguments about some of the reforms that we should make. Now, Senator Capito has been a big advocate of that. And I agree that those of us who advocate for a program have an obligation to kick the tires, check it out, make reforms so that the intended purpose is what's being served and it's not being gamed. So I, for one, who am a strong proponent of the Affordable Connectivity Program, pledge to work uh, with my colleagues, Republican and Democrat, to make it better. But we're not there yet. And what we can't do, Mr. Chairman, is you so assertively state is let this expire because there's four million veterans who depend on this. There's a lot of seniors who depend on it. And the economic arguments that we're having back and forth, they're real, we've got to deal with them. And some of those 
uh, Dr. Winfrey, we, we can, I can accept, but we can't let this expire. And that's what's happening. So my hope, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, all of us work hard together to try to get a short, at least a short-term fix while the work you're doing uh, leading uh, the, universe, the, 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 the working group uh, comes up with a longer-term solution. So I just want to express my gratitude uh, to the witnesses here, it, uh, but I also want to express my enormous apprehension that uh, this Congress may fail by letting this expire rather than continue it while we work out the, the long-term changes that are needed uh, for sustainable access. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Welch. Senator Capitol, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, before I ask the questions, I would like to take a moment to express my disappointment with how the markup went, or should I say more accurately, did not go uh, yesterday. I have worked with my colleague, Senator uh, Klobuchar, on my Rural Broadband Protection Act beginning last Congress. It's a common sense bill that will help USF high cost projects across our country. It's been sitting in this committee since the beginning of this Congress and after working to improve the bill, my substitute amendment was cleared to be marked up both by the majority and the minority back in November. I urge the chair through you <laughs> to schedule a legislative markup this work period so that my top broadband policy priority can be considered. I would appreciate you We'll, we'll talk to the chair and ranking member about that. So moving to my questions, um, Ms. DeWitt, I know that many states, and I, I think you've gone through this, and I caught the tail end of you uh, mentioning it to uh, um, Senator Peters. West Virginia was the second state that actually got uh, their Part 2 bead uh, plan uh, um, okayed. Uh, and we're very uh, excited about that. But can you describe the impact on bead programs? Because we have part of the affordable connectivity plan as part of our deployment plan, um, how this will uh, affect if the ACP does not get affected or uh, funded. Yes, and thank you for the question, uh, Senator Capito, uh, and for your ongoing work uh, to continue uh, supporting the program, including for robust discussions about potential reforms. Um, right now, let me just draw attention to the current costs uh, per passing that uh, were shared from West Virginia's capital projects funds, and that's $4,200 per location. Uh, what research from the Boston Consulting Group has found that uh, without uh, the bead subsidy, we will see a $500 per location differential uh, on uh, Without the ECP. Sorry, yes, without ECP. Uh, sorry, excuse me. So uh, the Boston Consulting Group study found that uh, without ACP, uh, the cost per passing may increase by $500 per location. So what we can assume from this is that the cost for deployment in West Virginia will increase without uh, ACP um, available. Does the, uh, is that, would you say 4200 uh, yes, ma'am. The uh, but that's with the capital projects fund. Uh, what the state has spent, then that includes uh, significant matching funds uh, from in internet service providers as well. So right now, I, I've been told, and I, and I and I can see living in such a beautiful state, which lovely mountains, but hard rocks in between. Um, <laughs> that 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 the cost to build in our state, obviously for fiber, is is much greater. How does that forty two hundred stack up? I'm just curious to know: is that high? Is high cost? Um, I would need to get back to you uh, okay. to quote the specific numbers, uh, but yes, that is, uh, the numbers are high, and of course the uh, cost per uh, location passing is going to depend on a number of factors, including uh, the topography, uh, as we right. are all familiar with West Virginia, but right. also density of population. Yeah. Okay, um, Dr. Winfrey, one of, I mean, I've been alluded to as the one who wants to be the uh, reformer, and I, I couldn't be more passionate about this. I mean, just... I think it was this week, earlier this week, the president of a local uh, internet service provider said that he was informed that he's eligible for the $30 a month because of the way it's uh, the school lunch program in, in our state makes everybody el eligible. I mean, it cannot possibly be true that 23 million people really need this. We've got to narrow it down to the need. I'm supportive of the program. Um, could you respond to that? 
I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, ACP is fundamentally not a not a program for rural areas. It is a program for urban areas. Uh, most ACP recipients live in urban areas, even after you adjust for the fact that most people live in urban areas. And the challenges that people have in both urban versus rural areas are very different, as, uh, as you are an expert on representing the great state of West Virginia. Um, that said, uh, like other government programs as well, I mean, I, I referenced um, in my uh, responses to Senator Cruz, we had a similar challenge uh, with the Affordable Care Act. There are premium tax credits that people get to help them afford uh, uh, private health insurance. And we, we learned very quickly that there were millionaires who were receiving those premium tax credits right. for lots of different reasons. And th so there needs to be a reconciliation process to, to, to make sure that the, the funds are targeted uh, in the best way and that both urban, there's an urban versus rural adjustment. Well, yeah, I would be interested in the urban and rural uh, adjustment. I, I just think that I understand the urgency and the, and the expiration, and instead of $30, I understand it's $14. I don't know how long that's going to last. Does anybody know what the long, yes? One month. So, you know, ostensibly not, not long, not long at all. We've known this was coming. We've been talking about reform for a year. I don't know why we have to be pressed now to move forward to a way over expansive program that is being, um, is, is going towards people that, some people that don't need it. So, because it just, it's not fair to the people that do need it because it, it calls into question what's going to happen with the entire program. So I would, I would uh, ask my colleagues to listen to experts on the, on the panel here to figure out a way that we can do both of these things. And I think we can and meet the challenges. Obviously, I'm in a state that has economic challenges. We have some of the lowest broadband deployment in the entire country. Um, you know, and, and I think it's uh, the digital divide. You can see it all over our state with economic development, education progress, health care um, outcomes. And so I am very passionate about getting to the last house and to make sure that, that, that everybody has equal access, but that they can afford it at the same time. So I thank you all for what you're doing, and I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, the chance to uh, uh, address the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Capito. Senator Warnock, you're recognized for questions. Thank you so very much, Chairman uh, Lujan. I'm extremely disappointed that politicians in Washington allowed the Affordable Connectivity Program to completely run out of funding this week. This program is critical for helping 720,000 Georgians afford the internet, particularly rural Georgians and older Georgians often say that broadband is to the 21st century what electrification was to the 20th century. And as you watch Washington dally around something so important, one way of thinking about it is, is, is as if we were wondering whether or not people need electricity. Is that fundamental or is it, or is it something extra? So hundreds of thousands of Georgians are about to start seeing their internet bills shoot up this month because some of my colleagues refuse to fund this important program. But the Affordable Connectivity Program is not just a tool to close the digital, digital divide, as important as that is, and increase our global connectivity. It's also a healthcare lifeline for hundreds of thousands of Georgians, particularly rural residents, vet veterans, service members, and seniors across the country. This is especially true in a state like Georgia. According to a recent study, military families make up nearly half of the households that benefit from the ACP. Mr. Levin, does the ACP help veterans and military families access critical health care services? There have been a number of studies to demonstrate that. A absolutely. And, and in your testimony, Mr. Levin, you cite two studies one from the Department of Veterans Affairs, showing that veterans who use telehealth emergency services were half as likely to make a costly trip to an emergency department. So right. as is often the case, the right thing to do here is also the smart thing to do. Uh, we know that veterans or anybody having to go to get emergency health care for routine care, or something that could have been arrested earlier, uh, is a problem not only for that person, but it's not a cost-effective way for us to manage our, our affairs. 
Uh, the other study showed that telehealth access helps save patients and the federal and the federal government money, as, as I, I point out. Uh, it sounds like the ACP can help both increase access to health care while reducing costs and saving the government money. Is that is that correct? That's correct. And so in that sense, it's a win-win. The right thing to do is a smart thing to do. Absolutely. Uh, that's why I've spent years fighting to expand access to health care and to reduce costs. And that's why I continue to fight to cap the cost of insulin at $35 for everybody. And it's why I will continue to champion the ACP. All of these things are connected. When people can't stay connected, it impacts their health care, their overall quality of life. Now, Mr. Levin, your testimony also notes the similarities between where internet subscription rates are low and where maternal mortality rates are high. When internet, uh, where internet subscription rates are low and where maternal mortality rates are high. Can you speak more about the connection between broadband affordability and maternal mortality. I think that's not something that, that people think about every day. Yeah. Tell us about that. So I think it's important to remember correlation does not imply causation, but the FCC mapping demonstrated, and if you look at the map of maternal mortality and you look at the map of where not as many people are connected, there does seem to be uh, a correlation. But that's not necessarily, again, a, a, a causality. But what's also true is you, and I put this in the uh, testimony, um, what people have been able to do, and this is the innovation cycle we really want to encourage, they have been using um, that broadband connection to help pregnant women uh, identify things before they're really a big problem to engage in certain practices that make uh, the birthing safer and things like that. Preventative, this goes to what you were saying earlier, preventative care is a win-win, but a lot of times people don't have time to go to the hospital um, and therefore, a broadband connection saves them that time, and they're more able, and, and there's a greater incentive to do that preventative care. Right, and, and I, I appreciate the, the care with which you approach this as a, a scientist, that causation uh, and correlation are not necessarily uh, connected. But, this, but in a state like Georgia, where, again, all of these things are, connect, are connected, there's connectivity in a, whole, in a, in a different way, uh, in a state like Georgia, where we're seeing hospitals close, some 10 hospitals in, in a decade, as we've refused to expand Medicaid, uh, this access, it seems, for people's overall health care would be critically important. Absolutely. Thank you so very much, and um, I hope that uh, we can get this program the funding that it needs to operate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Warnock. Next, we'll hear from... Our ranking member, Mr. Thune, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Winfrey, in your testimony, you discussed the impact that deregulation has on broadband prices. The current FCC seems intent on increasing its control and regulating every aspect of the Internet, most recently with its so-called net neutrality order. In your experience, what is the impact of highly regulated sectors of our economy, and what are the practical effects of the FCC's regulations on broadband prices? One instance where the uh, Congress stepped in and nullified a FCC rule, and we saw prices for both wired and wireless drop pretty significantly. For wireless, drop 10 percent, and for wired, drop 2 percent. Uh, but you know, taking a step back and, and asking what regulation generally does to prices, I mean, where we see highly regulated marketplaces, education, health care, um, uh, transportation, we tend to see higher prices. Uh, so there's a direct connection between more regulation and higher prices. And there's a direct connection typically between more government involvement, even on the subsidy side, and higher prices. So um, testimony before the committee today references data that for every dollar invested in ACP, GDP sees an almost fourfold increase. How do you respond uh, to the findings presented in that white paper? Uh, I have looked at the white paper. Um, uh, the co-authors of the white paper were a, ge a geographer at George Mason University and a high school senior in Fairfax County. 
And uh, as, a, as an economist, I mean, quite frankly, it's a very impressive um, paper by a high school senior. Uh, I would love to have them as my, my student. Uh, the problem with the analysis is that it relies on what's called input-output analysis, which assumes that there is no change in a policy response on behavior. Uh, this is something that economists have, have, have known has been uh, a suboptimal way to model things since, uh, uh, since the late 1970s, as a matter of fact. Um, there was an economist uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, 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 Bob Lucas, who won the Nobel Prize in 1995 for, for suggesting um, and showing that this kind of analysis has major, major challenges. So, you know, I think that there are better ways to do this, um, but I, I would take the, the $1 for $4 with a grain of salt. And that, in that they used a static model, is essentially what you're saying? It does use a static model, but the, the, the t again, sort of taking a step back, one of the, the main assumptions that it makes is that ACP doesn't actually exist. And all we're doing is adding ACP on top of an economy without modeling any of the behavioral in, in, uh, impacts that ACP might have, including on prices, which is one of the, the sort of um, main components of of my research, looking at the effect that ACP has on prices. The other thing that it doesn't do that's important, and I mentioned this earlier, is that for every dollar that we're spending right now, so since the beginning of 2020, 76% of all new spending since the first quarter of 2020 has been funded by a debt, by a new, new, new bonds, treasury bonds. 14% uh, through money creation. Only 7% has been paid for with revenue. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're seeing interest payments on the debt skyrocket and interest rates skyrocket. So for every dollar that you borrow to spend on something, you're paying 5.5% uh, interest that rolls over on a three-month basis just given how Treasury has had to manage its, uh, its debt management over the last couple of years. So that's one of the reasons why we're seeing inflation, and you need to take something like that into account if you're uh, projecting the impacts of any program, ACP or any program, on, uh, on economic growth. Right. And it is, a, it is a dynamic economy, which is why there, there are a lot of interactions and, and those right. have to be mapped out as well. It seems like this was a fairly um, isolated uh, study. Uh, similarly, Chair Rosenworcel has been pushing an ACP, uh, quote, fact sheet that states that, and I quote, more than three quarters of respondents say losing their ACP benefit would disrupt their service by making them change their plan or drop internet service entirely, end quote. Um, is this actually what the FCC's survey data reveals, in your view? So I think there are two, two issues here. The first issue is, what does the survey data show? And then the second issue is, is this survey something that we can rely upon? And this is actually uh, following up on something that uh, Mr. Witt mentioned a few moments ago within regards to making sure that we're getting the right information out of FCC to make policy decisions. Um, so if you take the FCC's data as gospel, then it shows that only 15.7% of folks will lose uh, broadband coverage if ACP goes away. Now the problem is, is that the way the survey was conducted is they went out to 110 households and only 5,300 and some households responded to the survey. Now, OMB says that when your survey response rate is under 70%, in this case, than the 5,300 and some odd house, households, you have to have a, a methodology, a new methodology for addressing that non-response rate. And so FCC didn't do that. And that's one of the challenges that I have as an economist and somebody who looks at government survey data on a regular basis. I don't even know how to read this survey. Like I, you know, it, it might be representative, it might not be representative. The reality is, is that we just don't know and, and we shouldn't be passing it along as if it is representative. Rather, we should, F, we should ask FCC and potentially fund them to go collect more and better data on, on the program. Thank you. My, Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. Let me just close by saying there's been some discussion today, too, about the BEAD program. Um, our telecom producer or telecom providers were in town this week, and this is the co-ops, the independents, those that serve the most rural areas of South Dakota. And there isn't a single one of them that can use the BEAD program. 
And, and the reason is because of all the conditions and rules and regulations that the administration attaches to the program, many of which are completely unrealistic for the kind of service that these, uh, these folks provide in, in rural areas of the country. So um, sometimes um, getting more government involved in some of these issues uh, ends up not being a good solution. It ends up making matters worse. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thun. Mr. Tester, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the folks who testified for, for being here. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Winfrey. Um, I believe in capitalism, I'm sure you do. I believe in competition in the marketplace. Broadband's kind of a little different situation in that, um, number one, if we, uh, and maybe this is, you can disagree with me if you want. Uh, I think the private sector doesn't necessarily interested in laying broadband into rural America in places like I live where the nearest neighbor's uh, a mile away, um, and I live in a place that isn't the end of the earth, truthfully. Um, but, but the question is, is that, so we put money into an infrastructure bill to help these companies lay broadband. We didn't want broadband to be laid over existing broadband because then that's a waste of money. So that competition, that competition issue goes away. The question I have is, it doesn't do any money to lay broadband if people can't afford it. it just doesn't do, any, doesn't do any good. How do we make it affordable? If not with this program, how do we make it affordable when especially in rural areas where I still have folks that don't have, don't have any internet service whatsoever. They don't have fiber, they ain't got nothing. Um, they got a phone, that's it. Um, and they probably like it that way, by the way. But, yeah. but how do we make it affordable? If not with this program, how do we make it affordable? When in fact there isn't the competition in the marketplace that there normally would be to help drive down prices and give the consumer an honest value for their, for their product. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, given the state of the economy that we're in, I think that there are major problems with subsidizing demand. I don't think that those same problems exist in subsidizing supply. Uh, and so take BEAD, right? So we've, we've talked a little bit about, about BEAD today. You've got 20 states that have already come out and said that they want to use their BEAD funds for non-deployment, right? Which tells me, given that broadband deployment was sort of central to the BEAD program, that those initial allocations might not have been exactly right, right? Okay. So I think, you know, we need to think about, like, what, 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 to, do on, what to do on that side. Um, I would also encourage folks to go look at the state and local fiscal recovery funds. So in ARPA, there were $350 billion in state and local funds. Um, of the $350 billion, there's still $70 billion remaining that has not been obligated by states and local governments. The Biden administration has been pushing this on states and locals. They've been pushing it on nonprofits to go try to encourage people to think outside the box. One of the problems with the SLFRF money is that in order to spend it, you have to allocate it to one of seven categories. If one of those categories is infrastructure or broadband or um, housing or anything where you're actually building something, yep. you, you have to um, uh, uh, fill out more paperwork. And so what the states and locals are doing is that they're channeling it all into um, what's called revenue replacement or negative economic impact, right? Which I think has led to an overspending on those categories and an underspending on critical infrastructure. Okay. And so that's, I, I, would, I would think sort of creatively about how to, how to, how to, how to, how to get, some of those, get some of those capital investments involved. Uh, okay, uh, so um, we do a lot of things here. Military, for example, we, we, we give an increase for housing allowance, okay, BAH they call it. And what happens many times when we announce we're giving an increase for housing allowance, guess what happens? The people who are renting, they think, yeah, they jack it up before they even get it. So it's a net zero and sometimes even worse. Is there any way, and I'll stick with you, Dr. Winfield, not that the other guys aren't a lot of fun, because you are, but is there any way when we have um, a subsidy program, and I'm in agriculture, so I know what subsidies are all about, is there any way when we have a subsidy program to hold, particularly the big companies, I, I really, I'm a rural guy and I don't think the, the rural, the rural co-ops are doing this as much, but the big companies tend to uh, 
get what you can get out of the marketplace. And if that subsidy goes up, they'll jack their rates. Is there any way to stop that? Well, that's exactly what my research finds, right? And part of the reason why my research finds this is that ACP is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is predominantly a program that serves urban areas relative to rural areas when rural areas have a completely different challenge. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and I mean, I'll just, uh, I'll give a, um, a, I'll give sort of my own example. I, I have a, my, my sister lives in the middle peninsula, peninsula in Virginia, which is a really rural farming community um, between the peninsula and the, and the northern neck. And they don't have many options there. Um, mobile doesn't work very well because uh, you're close to the bay. Fixed wireless doesn't work very well. And they've, they've received a lot of money from the state, that region, to build fixed wire. Um, and it's, it's now there and it's, it's actually fairly, fairly cheap, right? But they have one, one option and it's fairly cheap for the buy-in. At some point, those folks who have then bought into those plans are going to have their rates increased if there isn't competition. And so I think what we need to do is ultimately focus on supply, ultimately focus on competition, and that's what will bring those rates down in a sustainable way at some point in the future. I, 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 and I'm, I'm over time, and excuse me if I might. I, uh, I un understand, and I, no, 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 I, I, I agree with you fundamentally, except it is so damn expensive to lay broadband and in rural America, I don't know how you're ever going to get competition. I just don't know unless we're willing to lay several lines or, God, I don't know, you guys probably make rules that force other companies to be able to use the lines or whatever. There's all sorts of stuff out there. But I just don't know how we, in, in, you know, in, in a grocery store, yeah, we get more food manufacturers. In energy, we'll get more people that, that are creating energy, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's carbon-based or, or, or renewable. Uh, there's things we can do in those. In this one. It's just a different marketplace that somewhat holds the consumer at a big disadvantage. You don't have to say anything, but I had to get that off my chest. Thanks. Thank you very much, Senator Tester. Senator Markey, you recognize your question. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with everything Senator Tester um, just said. Um, I also want to take a moment to celebrate the FCC's vote last week to reinstate critical net neutrality rules. Um, the new rules are important to protect the free and open internet, and the evidence shows clearly that the rules do have no impact on broadband investment in the country. So just congratulations to the FCC. As everyone knows, uh, we're at a crisis point for the Affordable Connectivity Program. May is the first month when ACP Households will not receive the full $30 discount on their monthly broadband bill. Instead, that discount will only be $14, which is less than half of the subsidy. For households on tribal lands, the May benefit is just $35, down from $75 previously. And I'm deeply concerned that faced with this cost increase, many ACP beneficiaries will drop their internet service. And that would be a huge loss. That is why last week I led my colleagues in a letter to the trade associations of the major ACP corporations and urge them to cover the shortfall in the May benefit. Given that the $14 billion in ACP benefits ultimately returns to the corporations who are the providers, um, this money is a small price to pay for ensuring that ACP households receive a full discount in May. Mr. Le Levin, um, do you agree that um, providers should ensure that ACP households receive the full $30 uh, benefit in May. Um, I certainly hope that they follow your advice and do that. I would only add to that that um, voluntary efforts are not a long-term solution. We need a long-term solution. Um, I was very supportive, as, as you know, for issues, uh, for initiatives like Comcast Internet Essentials and other kinds of things, very helpful, but it was not a solution to get everybody on, which is what we really need. Yeah, so the, the corporations should help us to create a bridge here, like a minor solution. Bridges are good. They get, they get the primary benefit financially out of this. And we just have a short window to get these, um, uh, to get this solved, and uh, we just don't want these households to lose their critical uh, benefits. And as we consider proposals to reform the Universal Service Fund, we must make sure to protect existing programs that have been instrumental in closing the digital divide. 
At the top of that list is the Universal Service Program for Schools and Libraries, better known as E-Rate. So I was the Democratic author of the E-Rate program. I actually named it the E-Rate program. I was going to call it the Ed Rate, but then my staff said, nah, I remember that. can't do that. Okay, we'll just call it the E-Rate for education. Mm -hmm. So I did that in 1996. Named it, created it. Um, and so the program has delivered over $60 billion um, to connect schools and libraries to the internet, including 900 million from Massachusetts. And that money has primarily flowed to disadvantaged and low-income communities across the country. So, Mr. Levin, you were there in 1996 you. at the FCC yes. to implement it. Do you agree that any changes to the Universal Service Fund must protect E-Rate? Uh, I certainly agree that it should protect E-Rate and the mission of E-Rate. I would just note, because I think it's important, you know, um, you and I have both aged a little bit. I think we may be the only people in this room who were there in 96. So, yeah. I, I was going to say you have aged much more gracefully and much more beautifully than I have. But the E-Rate program has also aged extremely well. But, it, we, you know, we did have to do some reforms. And I think the FCC's reforms were in 2014. And those reforms were great. And if you look at the Education Superhighway Report in 2019, you can see that the reforms led to a number of tremendous improvements for the state. So I, 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 we should absolutely protect E-rate. We should absolutely protect this mission. But I would be open to, you know, things that make it even better. So um, that is the challenge. Uh, ACP is part of a broader mission to make sure that everybody is connected to the tools they need, as Congress said, to fully participate in the economy and society. Yeah. So it's actually, it's not your age, it's the age of your idea. So <laughs> right. I like to think of myself as still the youngest guy in the room. So yeah. uh, E-rate has stood the test of time. You know, if it can be improved, that's fine, but it's, it's, it's survived the test of time. So yeah. any changes must be carefully calibrated to elicit a, a, a solution that actually improves it and doesn't undermine it. And, and ACP is exactly the kind of program that does show how government and industry and community organizations can all work together. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just have to continue that tradition uh, and, uh, and ensure that as we move forward, we do so with a uh, consensus. And we just want to keep this program going uh, because if it fails, it just will undermine public trust because it will just be a failure on the part of the government and the private sector to come to a solution that helps community organizations provide that service. And thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member for all of your great work on this program. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Markey. Senator Rosen, you're recognized for questions. Well, thank you, Chairman Lujan. Of course, Ranking Member Kuhn, it's uh, really important we hold this hearing today and I thank all the witnesses uh, for being here because earlier this week, we crossed a new threshold. The end of April marked the last month that households will see, of course, as everyone has stated, the full $30 ACP benefit on their internet bills. I was proud to help write and pass the broadband section of the bipartisan infrastructure law, which created uh, the affordable connectivity program to lower internet costs for Nevadans and people across the country. But due to congressional inaction, there are people today already seeing higher costs because the program's funding has run out. I remain committed to finding a path forward to save ACP to ensure high-speed internet is not only accessible, but affordable to working families in Nevada. And the time has run out, and that means the time to act is now. And so I wanna talk a little bit on some of the impact for my Nevada seniors and my Nevada veterans. I wanna hone in on one of the points Senator Vance made earlier. Losing access to internet due to high costs can also raise costs, like I said, for seniors, for veterans, uh, even the federal government. Federal agencies like the VA and Medicare use telehealth and online services to save taxpayer funds and provide more timely assistance to veterans and seniors. Telehealth, I can't tell you how important it is to people in our rural communities in rural Nevada. It matters, it makes a difference. They're getting this, their care this way. It's saving lives. But sometimes the nearest in-person service is hundreds of miles away. So Mr. Levin, how might ACP lapsing make it harder for, act, uh, for veterans to access their benefits, and especially when they go through uh, the VA? 
it does it in a variety of ways. One of the interesting things that's been developing in the last few years is because of ACP, there are a lot of social service providers, both in the government but also in the nonprofit communities, that are restructuring the way. They now have an incentive to restructure um, how they deliver those services to make it more effective, more efficient, to allow people to get help 24-7 instead of 9 to 5. So it can affect um, veterans who depend on a variety of government services, not just with health care, though health care is probably the number one um, way. But if they get cut off, if they can't afford um, internet mm -hmm. connectivity, then everything they do to try to make their lives better will become more difficult. Yeah, I think the same thing would go for our seniors and for many of our social service agencies that work all around our state. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record a letter from health plans across the U.S. in support of continuing to fund the ACP. With no objection. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit in the time left about the broadband multipliers. So, research has identified broadband adoption as a super multiplier. What does that mean? Just like we talked about, it increases access to health care, creating more opportunities through teleeducation and for jobs. And well, I would say in Nevada for tourism as well. And so, Mr. Levin, how can you talk about the downstream effects of broadband affordability? How does affordable access to the internet connection uh, spur better educational outcomes, health out outcomes, better jobs, uh, just increase all of our connections and our ability to move all around our state, particularly in our uh, underserved and rural areas. And this lapse in ACP, how does it reverse those benefits? Yeah, I think you've hit upon a key point here, which is, as I mentioned in the oral testimony, um, broadband internet access is really a general purpose technology. It is like electricity, as, as Senator Tester was saying, in the sense that it doesn't enable one thing. It enables lots of things. And so all of those things that you mentioned are improved. Um, earlier we were talking about job training and job placement. Now, by the way, again, artificial intelligence is going to change the way people do job, change the way that they have to uh, keep learning and learning. You're not going to do that by you know, going to community colleges live all the time. You're going to do it at home, at night. Uh, you're going to keep upgrading your skills. And then how do you find that job? The majority of jobs, the vast majority of jobs are now posted only online. Mm -hmm. So that's a benefit to everybody. Um, but that's just one of a thousand examples we could use. Well, thank you. Um, I have so much more to talk about our impact on rural communities and infrastructure investments that uh, how we're going to expand the digital divide if we don't fund ACP and just create more and more inequities. I will submit those questions for the record. I see my time is up. Um, thank you. Thank you, Senator Rosen. And uh, before I close with no other speakers expected, I, I have a couple other questions. M Mr. Witt, in your work at Pew, you've assisted states in determining what constitutes reasonable prices for broadband for a middle class family, correct? Yes, that is correct. Now, it's my understanding that your work found that affordability can vary widely across regions, states, and counties. For example, the median affordability price for Texas is listed at $92.80. In DeMitt County in South Texas, the affordable baseline was $41.67. And in Rockwell County, located in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, affordability was $185.99. Mr. Witt, what are some of the reasons for such wide pricing differences in different states and counties? Uh, simply put, more research is needed to confirm that. Uh, what we know at this point uh, are that there are a range of factors that do influence affordability, um, including the type of service that is available, um, as well as, uh, simply put, what a customer can afford. Um, and uh, further, uh, that research, which I should point out, um, is based on a 2% um, uh, evaluation of middle income. Um, and uh, sorry, I won't go down on methodology. You don't need to hear about that. Uh, but I think what's important to note is uh, that what we found, even with those ranges, are that that middle, that 2% uh, number of uh, what could be a middle class, affordable for a middle class, is still more expensive uh, than what many families can afford. But fundamentally, um, there are a range of economic, social, um, and educational factors that influence affordability for households. I appreciate it. Senator Hickenlooper. 
you are recognized for your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks to all of you. I've caught bits of this uh, through the morning. Um, let me start with a question for uh, Ms. Case Navarez. Uh, during the pandemic, students nationwide had to adapt to learning remotely. Many had limited experience beforehand. Um, students without any broadband connection or, or a device uh, were disadvantaged, could not keep up with their peers. Uh, I think the digital divide is not just about broadband access, but about uh, broadband adoption and use. Um, so can, can you um, describe how you've seen this relationship between broadband adoption and education evolve over the last couple of years? Sure, um, in our state in particular, um, it has been a critical issue that the nation is watching. Um, community members, particularly our tribal community members, Hispanic community members, some of our disabled community members, have actually gone to the state to address equality of education. And a tech order came out uh, to note the importance of technology and the critical need for our students to actually have both connectivity and a device. Our state is rallying now and to address those needs, and it is not easy. The cost of devices, the cost of maintenance of devices, and of course, as we've mentioned here today, connecting many of our rural students, some of which actually in Navajo Nation, believe it or not, ride the bus two hours to get to school every day. So as we've noted, in our state, um, getting fiber to a home that far away over <laughs> canyons and mountains is expensive. And the cost, if there even is a choice, is expensive. We sit here in DC, there's 11, 000, more than 11,000 people per square mile. In the state of New Mexico, it's an average of 17. <laughs> so even if a family wants their student or wanted their student to be able to connect, it's often not an option or it's an expense they can't handle. Um, it has cost our students, uh, many of them returning to school post-pandemic, um, the challenge of catching up and um, the challenge of proceeding forward as we as a state look at how are we going to ensure all students all the time have technology and access as a tool for learning and advancing. Um, it's a heavy lift for us and a heavy lift for every state, but a lift we cannot delay and we cannot avoid. Right, thank you. Um, and I've got two more qu questions, so hopefully we'll get them, get, uh, I'll be concise in asking and you can get concise answers. Um, uh, Ms. DeWitt, the E-Rate program, the Lifeline program, uh, the rural health care program to support hospitals and clinics, the, uh, what they call the high cost program to uh, help uh, expand access in rural America. Defer during the pandemic, Congress authorized uh, uh, these programs to get to the same goals as the universal service fund through direct appropriations and unique appropriation rules. Um, how would you advise Congress to combine these pandemic era programs with the universal service fund to to be sustainable long-term? Uh, at this point, uh, we don't have research uh, on that issue to provide an informed answer. Uh, what we do know is that USF reform is needed. That's also uh, a question that is worthy of debate and further research, uh, and which we would be happy uh, to participate in as time moves forward. But I think the critical uh, point for us is that ACP is the cornerstone of BEAD. Um, and without ACP, uh, without a bridge for funding ACP, uh, we threaten um, billions in deployment grants across the country. So right. we hope that um, we find a short-term solution for ACP and a longer one for USF reform. We'll get you, get you back to work, uh, full-time employment for researchers, this issue. Um, Mr. Levin, uh, or Levin, I missed the beginning introductions. It's like Hickenlooper, Hickenlopper, either way. Um, that same question, we're looking at, I mean, the issue of, as I grew up, everyone paid in a little bit into a fund to make sure that everybody had telephone coverage uh, and was connected. Uh, we've, re we've introduced something called reforming broadband connectivity with uh, Senators Klobuchar and Thune, uh, finally trying to get the FCC to take action. 
you know, by basically expanding the contribution base to make sure that we have sufficient resources. So in your view, what is currently within the FCC's authority to expand the contribu contribution base to, like broadband providers, um, and what is not within their authority uh, without congressional legislation? Um, I, I, th I think they could expand it to uh, broadband providers. I don't think they could expand it to certain kinds of big tech operations as has been proposed by a number of different people. Um, and, and I would be happy to also uh, participate in any further discussions. I was involved in the 90s. I was involved uh, 10, 15 years ago on, in terms of various reforms. There's no question that there's a broader reform necessary. But the single most important point uh, that I think this hearing demonstrates is we need to keep everybody on. The government actually saves money by keeping people on. So let's have a short-term extension and let's get to the work. This is not the Middle East. We can solve this problem, um, and we can solve it in a reasonably short period of time. And we, can, we should look at a lot of different options uh, for how to do it. I might note there's some court cases pending that may affect those options. Sure. But I think fundamentally this is a congressional uh, decision, and it should be a congressional decision. And let's make that decision, and let's move on, and then 15 years later there'll be another hearing, and we'll have to reform it all over again. But that's fine, because that's, that's the truth of every program that's ever been ever occurred. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I look forward to keeping you all busy uh, in the years to come, because it is important. And it, it, I have not had a, a single uh, citizen, while the eight years I was governor of Colorado, who when explained the theory behind everyone paying a little bit more to make sure that everyone had some access, no one ever complained about that. So it, it is befuddling, to say the least, that we can't seem to find out that solution that is sitting there right in front of our face. Anyway, I yield back to the chair. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Senator Hickenlooper. And I'm uh, asking the committee um, to uh, submit a statement for the record from our street which is a self-described center-right think tank that engages in policy research in support of free markets and limited effective government without objection. Um, the study also uh, states something that I agree with, which is uh, our street um, states that the affordable connectivity program is, quote, a model of success and that, quote, has been a bright, pardon me, ha quote, has been a bipartisan program since its inception and it should remain so moving forward. I would also like to highlight research that R Street Institute Statements mentions, which takes a look at the effect ACP has had on the price of broadband by comparing broadband price offerings by companies who participate in ACP with similar offerings by companies who do not participate in ACP. This study demonstrates that ACP is successfully reducing the cost of internet plans for eligible households. The study also finds that ISPs are passing on cost savings to their customers. Mr. Levin, yes or no, in any of your research, have you seen evidence that the ACP itself is driving broadband prices higher? I appreciate that very much. But on Wall Street, write that. I appreciate that. And um, look, I hope that these programs will eliminate slow speeds across America. Um, I, I live in a rural community. I represent a very rural state. Um, most access to the internet is still over twisted copper. I was a former utility commissioner before I came to the Congress. So doing something about POTS, and that's not what everyone's trying to legalize now, that's plain old telephone service, right. which was delivered over twisted copper and then some really smart engineers figured out, well, we can increase capacity on twisted copper and then the world said, and all these corporations said, oh, that's how people living in rural America will get faster speeds. You know, we're going to boost them up from, from a, a dial-up tone. And some of you in the room may remember it, but you don't have the same color of hair as I do. But you used to go to download an email, not all your email, an email. And you would log in to AOL or whatever account you had, and you would you'd hit enter. And the, the phone would start, bzz, 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 you know, and everything would start talking to one another. And you'd leave for the day. <laughs> and you would come home to watch it, maybe finally downloading the one email. Unfortunately, that's how 
broadband providers across the world said, rural America, that's what they get. We're gonna solve this problem. Building a bipartisan deployment plan to rural America said, well, not anymore. In the same way that my colleagues asked about electricity and roads and this revolution across America to say that everyone matters. We're gonna make sure that we get this done all across the country. We're finally doing the same thing with broadband. Dr. Winfrey, the one area that I disagree, well, there may be a few areas. The one area that I'll highlight, ACP does help rural America. Things in rural America are expensive too. Um, I hope more programs look to rural America where most of our food is grown. There's an effort now to be smarter with um, the use of tractors like the ones that my colleagues at farm on large acreage to modernize them. You know, I, I still use the ones that you have to put it around in because it's, it's small acreage. It doesn't make sense for me. Um, uh, rural electric co-ops are a present service to us across the country because people believed that rural Americans deserved electricity too. Um, and I'm certainly hopeful that with these programs that we can eliminate slower speeds, that we can finally get higher speed connectivity to people living all across America. Um, and where competition doesn't exist, well, then what? I, I don't know if I'm hearing that we should overbuild. I'm surprised I used those terms because I don't use those terms. I don't know what overbuild means. Um, in order to get competition for broadband, you need a few pipes or you need a lot of fiber in a pipe so that other people can be able to get that service to you. Well, that's called overbuilding. They used to call it gold plating when I was on the Public Utility Commission. And it was all the rural telephone cooperatives who would get called out for gold plating. And now we applaud them for being smart and innovative and making these investments where, where you had innovative boards, they had some of the fastest connections in America. We should model after them. We should look after what they've been able to achieve. So I'm just going on and on here. I, I hope that we, we can find a way to work together as the bipartisan working group with USF has come up with really strong ideas. Democratic ideas, Republican ideas, thoughts that have come out of studies from the right and the left, from the center. Um, and it, it's, 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 a, it's a good methodology that I'm, I'm hoping that going forward, uh, programs will work better, that they touch the people that they are intended to reach out to, that whether we're in rural settings, urban settings, that where we have a hole and a flaw in American policy, th that we can do something about that as well. Um, so thank you to each of the witnesses for being available today, for traveling, for the preparation it takes to be able to come together and have a good conversation. I appreciate all my colleagues who participated today. There's a lot of interest in this particular space. Um, and before I wrap up, I want to enter a few more things into the record and I'd ask unanimous consent to enter a statement uh, from February 8, 2024 from the Wireless Infrastructure Association in support of extending ACP, a January 10th, 2024 statement from NCTA, the Internet and Television Association in support of extending ACP, a January 10th, 2024 statement from CTIA in support of extending ACP, a January 10th, 2024 statement from NCTA, the Rural Broadband Association in support of extending ACP, an April 15, 2024 statement from T-Mobile in support of extending the ACP and a statement for the record from AARP in support of ACP and sharing research findings about the importance of the programs for older Americans. Uh, I think we can get there. Um, we can find a way to work together. We can address concerns to ensure that we're gonna have real broadband connectivity across the country that's fast and that's affordable. Now, we know the stakes are simply too high, especially with our veterans and students, families, rural and older Americans. So over the next week, I'm committed to continue working with my colleagues to extend this program 
And once we do that, I look forward to bringing forth this long-term solution to permanently fund these programs with reforms with the work of the Universal Service Fund Working Group. Now, with that, I will close the hearing. Should members have additional questions for the witnesses, for the record, I ask that they submit them to the committee within two weeks, and witnesses will have an additional two weeks to respond. So everyone, thank you so very much for your time. I thank the staff for helping us get this done. This hearing is closed.